Prepare for a rude awakening. Now, the year 4029, things went down just a little bit differently. Because the gospel record says, John said it was, it was six days before Passover. It was the ninth of the month of Abib, and that's when Yahshua took a handful of his disciples and went out to Bethany, where his good friend Lazarus, whom he had just raised from the dead just weeks before, was living, and they stayed with him that night. That night, he was anointed with spikenard for his burial, as he had indicated, and the next morning, he instructed his disciples to do this. Get all of the rest of the disciples, which could have numbered in the hundreds, literally, and get them together at the gate of the city of Jerusalem. I want you to go out and find a donkey that's never been ridden and put your talits on it. And the next morning, we saw what happened. The high priest was out in Bethlehem getting the Passover lamb for that year. Just as he is coming around the corner and approaching the gate, that's when Jesus came up to the gate riding on the back of this donkey. It's the 10th day of the month. As he approaches the gate, his disciples begin crying out, Hosanna in the highest! Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord! Right then, 150,000 people rush out of every corner of Jerusalem. Every priest along the line begin crying out, Hosanna in the highest. It sounds like a hurricane in the city streets of Jerusalem. The whole place is in uproar, but yet the high priest is way up here, and who is coming in on a donkey? It's Jesus. When he comes up to the gate, the priests stop him and say, Tell your disciples to shut up! Quit saying this! And he said, I will not, I will not. If the rocks have to be given a voice, the rocks will cry it out. Why? This is the day the McRae is fulfilled. This is the day you've been rehearsing year after year, century after century. This is the day that the Passover lamb, who was born in the sheepfolds of Bethlehem 30 years before, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, he makes his triumphal entry in Jerusalem. You've been practicing it. This is it. If the rocks had to shout it out, it will happen because this is the day the McRae is fulfilled. This will go down and no one can stop it. The feast of the Lord will be fulfilled. Hallelujah. And then we see, as he goes up that path, the priest who are waving their palm fronds, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna in the highest. And then they see, it's a donkey. It's a donkey. It's a donkey. And then they look, it's Jesus on a donkey. And they're Hosanna in the highest. No, nothing is going to stop it. And as he comes by them, the whole street fills in behind him with everyone waving the palm fronds. And they're saying, Hosanna in the highest. And there's nothing they can do because the rest of the line and 150,000 people will not stop. Why? It's being fulfilled and nothing is going to keep the feast of the Lord from being fulfilled. God is in charge of the universe. He had this planned out and their rehearsal is now being fulfilled to the day, the hour, the exact moment and every detail. And then as he gets to the Temple Mount where the male Passover lamb is staked for the next four days and inspected by everyone, we see as the Gospel records how the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, the religious and civil leaders day after day after day for those four days are questioning him trying to find something wrong. It's the 13th day, and as the sun goes down, it turns into the 14th. And the 14th is the last day. It's a day of preparation, and after the sun comes up the next morning, that is when the Passover lamb will be killed the next day and prepared for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And it's after sundown that the Lord reclines with his disciples, has supper with them, the Last Supper, and it is at that Last Supper that he takes the bread and in the very words of Melchizedek, Melchizedek, which means 
the king of righteousness. Remember, it was Melchizedek who came out from Jerusalem when Abraham was coming back from the slaughter of kings when he had delivered his nephew Lot from the, the kings who had taken him hostage. He had just risked his life in a life and death battle, and when Melchizedek came out from Jerusalem, he brought forth bread and wine. It doesn't record everything that took place, but we know that right there, Abraham was so moved, he took a tenth of everything, and he gave it to Melchizedek. A tenth of everything he just risked his life for, because he was so moved with what Melchizedek shared. Because it was at that moment, Melchizedek took bread, and he held it in his hands, and spoke this blessing. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olom, homotzi lecha mim ha'aretz. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And he took the cup, and he blessed it. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olom, berei pri ha'gofen. And it was Abraham that then, at every Shabbat, and passed it down to all of his people, Century after century and every Shabbat, when we say that prayer, we know that when the Messiah comes, that he will interpret this mikra, this rehearsal that we have been doing. The last night that the Lord was with his disciples, he took bread, and in the words of Melchizedek, he said, Baruch atad and I eloheinu melech ha'olom, hamotzi lechem mim ha'aretz. And he said, this this, which you have been doing every year for a thousand years, which you have been doing every Shabbat, every Sabbath day, this is my body, which is broken for you. I am the bread of life. I am the bread which is brought forth from the earth. And this is my body, which will be broken for you. As often as you do it, from now on, do it in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup and he blessed it with that same blessing. He interpreted the mikra and said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Uh, to take my cup, divide it among yourselves. I will not take a sip of the fruit of the vine till I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. But you do this from now on until that day, do it in remembrance of me, because this represents my blood, which will be poured out for you. After that meal, he then told Judas what you do, do quickly. Judas then left. The rest of the disciples thought that he had sent Judas out to give something to the poor or buy something they would need for the feast. Now, the Last Supper was not Passover. That's only in your Western Gentile mind. The Last Supper was the Last Supper. You, once Passover meal happens, you don't go out and buy anything you need for Passover. It's a high, holy Sabbath. If you haven't prepared beforehand, you're not ready, and you missed it. But it's the 14th. It is the day of preparation. And so, later that night, he is arrested in Gethsemane, taken to the house of Annas, father-in-law of the high priest, a mock trial, then to Caiaphas, and then from Caiaphas' house, he is taken to the north wall of the Temple Mount of Jerusalem, where Pilate's Judgment Hall is. There, as the scriptures say, that the accusers led Jesus into the Pilate's Judgment Hall, but they refused to go in because they did not want to be defiled so that they could eat the Passover. Has Passover happened yet? No, the Passover lamb hasn't even been killed yet. And there's a, a law in the Torah, you don't eat an animal which is still alive. It's just... <laughs> basic cooking rules in America, but, uh, you know, see, we have to apply sound logic to the scriptures as well, okay? Now we see that Pilate comes out and finds out what the accusations are, and then he walks all the way inside and speaks to Jesus, and he finds out, oh, this has to do with the Torah and, uh, and, and the Jewish law, and he comes out and says, this man has done nothing against Rome. And then they brought more accusations. He would go back in again and address those accusations and find out that they were groundless, in and out, in and out. Finally, he goes in, and he's getting no help from Yahshua at all. You know, he's just not giving him some, some real helpful uh, solutions to get him off. And Pilate wants to get him off. He sees nothing wrong in what he's done. And he says, you know, please, don't you realize that I have the power to kill you? And that's when Yahshua said, you don't have any power except God give it to you. 
And right then, the chills ran up his spine. He walked out of that judgment hall. His wife came out and said, I have just had a terrible dream about this man. Have nothing to do with him. He's innocent. Pilate washed his hands. And then he went over and he sat in his judgment seat. Now, when Pilate sits in his judgment seat, it's just like the judge banging the hammer down. The next words that come out of his mouth are the verdict, it is law. And it is at this very moment that for the thousand years before, every single year at this very moment, the high priest was concluding his four-day inspection of the Passover lamb. And the high priest at this very moment would open his mouth and speak the words that now Pilate speaks, I find no fault in him. Pilate is not in control. Now, they take him out. And when he's not able to get him released, then he says, finally. And he beats him, and he's gone too far. He says, take him out and crucify him. And so they brought him out of the judgment hall. And as he left the judgment hall, they put the wood of the sacrifice on his back. And now, Isaac's question I have the wood of the sacrifice on my shoulders, Father. Where is the lamb? Abraham, the father, said, God will provide himself a lamb. Now, the lamb of God, with the wood of the sacrifice on his shoulders, walks out to the same path that Father Abraham led his son a thousand years earlier, walks out the north gate of the city of Jerusalem, out to the place of the skull, and that is a place where God had prepared an altar for his son in stone, directly under the place that Abraham had prepared an altar of stone and bound his son to the sacrifice. And there he is crucified on the Temple Mount, excuse me, on Mount Moriah, not at what was once the peak, but underneath what was once the peak. And the highest peak of Mount Moriah to this very day is right there. But this is a place where he was crucified. And at the very hours the Passover lambs were being sacrificed on the Temple Mount, usually under the full sun, with the, the sun going through those bowls of brass filled with blood, it was like golden lightning that would be shining off the Temple Mount, but this year it was pitch black. There was no glory on the Temple Mount. And as the scripture says, when he knew his hour was come, he said, I thirst. What was this hour that was come? When the high priest sacrificed the last lamb, which was the high priest's perfect Passover lamb. After all that on the Temple Mount, every year the high priest would say, I thirst. And they would give him a drink, and he would then cry out these words. When the Lord knew his hour was come, he said, I thirst. They brought out a sponge of vinegar, put it to his mouth, he pushed back up on his legs one last time, filling his lungs with air. And in the words of the high priest, which had been cried out this moment every year for a thousand years, he cries out when the last Passover lamb is sacrificed, It is finished! And he bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. It says the earth quacked and the rocks rent and split open. And to this very day, the earthquake crack is still there, extending through the ground.